Sellers are less eager to sell in an environment where they can't get the best price, and certainly rising interest rates have made it harder to uh, justify higher prices. Uh, so you have to be very disciplined um, and selective and pick businesses that you know a lot about or where you think you can systematically create value and that you have confidence in over the long term. I remember Barack asked me uh, before he ran for president what was the most important thing he could do uh, for young people of color if he ran for president. And I said, well, the most important thing you could do is win. When he was growing up in Ohio, Marty Nesbitt didn't know he would become a private equity investor. I had no idea in high school or in college, and even in business school, uh, for that matter, what private equity was and how it worked and how you got into it and what the right career paths to get there were. Now Nesbitt runs the Vistria Group, a $10 billion private equity firm he co-founded in 2013 that invests in healthcare, education, and financial services companies. But he didn't start out in the buyout industry. Before Vistria, Nesbitt built a strong reputation in Chicago business circles while he was running the billion dollar parking company he founded with future Secretary of Commerce Penny Pritzker. Some people own parking assets because they wanted to develop the real estate for different uses later. And I thought to myself, well, what if we owned these assets for the sake of owning these assets? Could we rationalize building a national brand? Could we rationalize investing in technology? So wrote a business plan around that idea, went to the Pritzkers, they liked it, uh, and uh, we launched the parking spot. In his spare time, Nesbitt blew off steam playing pickup games on the basketball court, where he developed a friendship with another prominent Chicagoan, Barack Obama. We met on the basketball court in Chicago and have been playing against and with each other for a number of years. Uh, when our wives' paths crossed at the University of Chicago. Nesbitt got involved in Obama's early political races, served as campaign treasurer in 2008, and currently chairs the Obama Foundation. As far as any involvement from the former president in the Vistria Group, Nesbitt is appropriately discreet. We don't talk about who our LPs are, but you know he's, he's, he's obviously supported what, what we're doing and believes in it. Now, I've said that private equity is the highest calling of mankind. Uh, do you agree <laughs> with that yet? Well, I think uh, it could be. I think uh, private equity players are in a position to make a really meaningful impact on the world and that we could leverage the way we use private capital to solve big problems. Now, in a relatively short period of time, you've built a very well-known mid-market buyout firm, which is now expanding into real estate and credit. Um, how did you do it in 10 years or so? What did you do to get this firm off the ground? Because you didn't have a back background in private equity. I think we were lucky and we had the right idea at the right time. I think one of my close friends says, Kip and Marty kind of caught lightning in a bottle. Uh, and I think the combination of building, investing in infrastructure and people early, uh, ahead of our fund size, uh, and then the timing with the investment thesis uh, facilitated that rapid growth. And of course, early success helped us accelerate it. When you look at a deal, uh, what are you, the things you're most looking for to decide if you're gonna go forward or not? Well, we try to be very proactive in the way we invest. So we spend a lot of time developing themes behind which we want to invest. And so when we, when a deal comes investment committee, we better have a theme, we better have an operating partner and advisors that know a lot about the business, uh, and we better have a relationship and an a with the management team and an angle to sort of systematically create value. How many deals have you done, control deals? You're, all your deals are buyout control deals? Yes. How many have you done in the 10 years or so? Uh, I think probably 45. Or and 45, all 45 worked out perfectly? <laughs> you know, this business, it's all hard, right? And everything doesn't work out exactly the way you plan, uh, but you do your best, best to bring the resources you have available to to optimize the outcome. Now, we've had a lot of success. So generally, people who invest in buyout funds are looking for today, I would say, net internal rates of return of 16, 17, 18 percent. It's harder to get much higher on a consistent basis given high inflation is and interest rates. But is that roughly what you're shooting for? Now, we try to underwrite to three times our money in five years, a 25 percent IRR. 
That's pretty good. Uh, it's pretty good. It's, I think, easier to do in the middle market uh, where, you know, the right resources, strategy, uh, a little elbow grease, you can sort of outrun the competition. Let's talk about your background. Where were you born? I was born in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, and your mother and father were? Yeah, my mother was, uh, uh, she is a nurse, or just retired as a nurse, but for most of her career, in fact, she graduated from college the same time I did, uh, uh, when she was much older, but uh, she was a domestic worker, a nurse's aide, my father worked in a factory, my mother was a piano player and choir director in the church. Where did you go to college? I went to a small school in Michigan called Albion College. So when you graduated, what did you want to do? Uh, you know, I had no idea what I wanted to do when I went to undergrad, uh, but there was a guy at Albion named Joel Manby who was in the same fraternity that, was, that I was in, but I, we never met. He graduated before I got there, but he had this reputation of being really smart. He was an economics major. He was an athlete, and he had gone to General Motors and gotten a GM fellowship. And so, because I had nothing, no other way to create a roadmap, when I heard the story and I heard how much people admired him, I said, I'm going to do that. And so when, when uh, GM came to campus, I went to interview, and I went there thinking, when I go, I'm going to become a GM fellow. All right, so you did. I did. I had no idea when I went that it was like one or two GM fellows out of 800 or 900,000 employees. But uh, I got really lucky. So how many years were you at General Motors? I was at General Motors for two and a half years, okay. and I became a GM fellow. And, and eventually you decided to go to business school. That's when I decided to go to business school. So you wanted to go and you got accepted in the University of Chicago uh, School of Business. What did your mother say? <laughs> Are you crazy? Are you leaving uh, General Motors to go back to school? She didn't even know what an MBA was. And of course, in the African-American community, uh, getting a job at a company like General Motors was the be all end all. Uh, so my mother was very proud, my father was very proud. Uh, and so when I told them I was leaving, they thought I'd lost my mind. You formed a partnership with uh, Penny Pritzker at some point to do parking, is that right? Yeah, so when I was uh, working at JLL, um, that we went through this real estate recession in the early 90s and the senior people at the firm said, let's do a retrospective on all these different asset classes to see what happened, why we, how we overpaid, why we ran into so much trouble, what really happened in the marketplace. And when I did that, I recognized, well, there were a lot of reasons why I liked the parking assets better than I did office and retail and industrial. Uh, and so I started really noodling on the differences between those asset classes and came up with a rationale to start a business uh, in the parking space. But I crossed paths with Penny Pritzker, who later became our Secretary of Commerce. Uh, and she liked the idea, and she and I I went off on this adventure together and built a real estate operating company in the parking space. Okay, and so how big did it become? You know, it's probably a billion and a half uh, dollar business at and this who point. Who owns it now? It owned, it's owned by a private equity firm. Uh, we sold it to a private equity firm. And right. that's the transition to private equity. People always ask, like, how did you go from being in the parking business into being in private equity? Well, when I was in the parking business, I bought my biggest competitor in a partnership with a private equity firm. So in other words, you had a parking lot business with Penny Pritzker. Mm -hmm. You sold a piece of it to, or some of it to a private equity firm. You said, these guys are not that much smarter than I am, if they're as smart as I am. So if they can do it, I can do it. Basically. <laughs> I remember Barack asked me uh, before he ran for president, what was the most important thing he could do? Uh, for young people of color if he ran for president. And I said, well, the most important thing you could do is win. Twenty twenty three is off to a rough start for private equity firms. It's a stark difference from just two years ago. In 2021, the industry shattered records, doubling deal volume from 2020 for a global buyout value of more than $1 trillion. But in the first quarter of 2023, deal making slowed to $182 billion, a 60% plunge from the first quarter of 2022. Why? 
The Federal Reserve's fight against inflation has led to the fastest pace of interest rate hikes in 40 years. Those higher rates make it harder and more expensive to borrow money. As a result, private equity firms have pursued fewer deals. Fundraising has slowed too as investors juggle broader economic uncertainty and fears of a looming recession. Private equity firms have raised just $325 billion in 2023 compared to $459 billion during the same period in 2022, according to data from Prequent. After more than a decade of cheap debt, private equity firms may need a new playbook to overcome this year's challenges. It's well known that it's harder to raise money for private equity today because some people are over allocated, they would say, and also uh, interest rates are higher. People are looking at private credit more than private equity. So how hard is it today to go out and raise private equity dollars? Yeah, it certainly has gotten more difficult than it was uh, in the last previous five years. Uh, 10 years ago, it was really hard for us uh, because we're a new firm. Uh, but look, yes, the, the obviously the Equity markets change that sort of deno have that denominator effect for for a lot of capital allocators, and that makes it hard for them to commit more to private equity. Uh, but you know we have a niche, very focused strategy, and we've had some success. I think the industries we focus on are pretty resilient, and so uh, it's taking us a little longer to raise capital. But uh, um, I think we'll we'll get there, but it's no doubt tougher. And your capital mostly comes in from the U.S., or do you raise money outside as well? Mostly from the U.S., but we do have some uh, some capital from Europe and, and the Middle East and other places. And what about finding deals? Is that easier or harder today in this environment? It is harder. Um, well, look, sellers are less eager to sell in an environment where they can't get the best price, and certainly rising interest rates have made it harder to uh, justify higher prices, and so there are fewer deals available. And of course, those companies that are being sold are really, really good companies, and there's a lot of competition for them, uh, and so prices are, are high. Uh, so you have to be very disciplined um, and selective and pick businesses that you know a lot about, uh, where you think you can cr systematically create value and that you have confidence in over the long term. And so that's what we try to do. And look, we will, over equitize businesses in this environment and worry about financing them to their capacity later uh, when the debt markets are a little bit more stabilized. Uh, so, but so it's tougher, but you gotta have an angle, you gotta have a network, you have to have a systematic way to create value. Now, when he was elected president of the United States, Barack Obama was said to have a best friend and that best friend was said to be you. So I assume you're still a pretty good friend of his, but was that a plus or a minus in building your firm? People would say, well, he's really a political person, he knows Barack Obama, or would people say, no, he's really, really substantive and he knows more than just Barack Obama? So how did that work? Well, I remember Barack asked me uh, before he ran for president what was the most important thing he could do uh, for young people of color if he ran for president. And I said, well, the most important thing you could do is win uh, because it would change the way the world perceived people of color in a pretty profound way. Young people would think about their futures in a different way. Certainly, he handled himself as president uh, with grace and integrity. And so I think there is a halo associated with being the friend of a person who conducted himself in such an admirable way. Even people who disagreed with him trusted him, knew he was being honest and wanted to do the right thing. And so I think, broadly speaking, that helped. So when did you first meet Barack Obama? We met on the basketball court in Chicago and have been playing against and with each other for a number of years uh, when our wives' paths crossed at the University of Chicago. And my wife came home one day and said, oh, I've become friends with this really smart, wonderful lady that works at the university. We're going to go and play Scrabble with her and her husband. And I was like, no, we're not going to play Scrabble. Uh, and she pressed me and pressed me. She said, you're going to like them during your life. So I went uh, to play, have dinner and play Scrabble with Barack and Michelle. And he walked out. I was like, oh, I've known you for forever. So we had been playing ball together. And that was the beginning of a relationship between us. Is he a good Scrabble couple. player? Really good. He carried. It was the men against the women. He carried us. So one day he comes to you and says, uh, you know, we play basketball together, but I, 
I think I'm going to run for the state legislature. Can you help me? Is that what happened? Yeah, he had he had uh, gotten sort of into the state legislature on his on his own, uh, but when he decided he wanted to run for Congress, he asked me if I would help. Well, he ran for Congress against Bobby Rush, yes. and he lost two to one against the incumbent. And then he decided, I'm going to run for the Senate, the United States Senate. Normally, if you lose in a House seat, you don't usually then run for the Senate seat, but he did. Did you tell him that wasn't going to work? No, uh, it's funny. It's a funny story. I, I, I was out in my front yard doing yard work, and uh, he was driving by, and he saw me. He pulled over and said, hey, uh, you know, I want to tell you what I'm thinking about doing next. You have a few minutes. And I said, yeah, for sure. And he said, okay, I'm going to run for Senate. And we started laughing. And uh, laughed so hard that the next day I was, why is my, you know, you go, why is my stomach hurt? So what? Like that kind of, that kind of laughed. And, but after we chuckled for a while, he said, no, 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 here's the deal, right? And he laid out a very cogent sort of path to how he could win. And uh, I said, look, man, I'm in. He decides to run for the presidency of the United States. Did he call you and say, guess what? I got something even funnier than <laughs> running for the Senate. No, we were, ha we were in Hawaii together at the time. We used to go every year for vacation. And he, he asked me uh, what I thought the odds of him being president were if he ran. And, uh, you know, I gave some small probability. Well, you said um, there's been so many African-American men right. elected president already. Named so. Barack Obama. Right. 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 But I gave him some small percentage and he looked at me funny and I said, no, no, look, if I had that probability of being president, I would run. Right. Because uh, I thought it was uh, substantive enough. And I knew he had this appeal. I watched the Senate campaign up close and personal. So I thought uh, he had, you know, as reasonable shot as any African-American would. So did you get involved in his campaign? Yeah, from the, from the very beginning, from that moment on. He gets the nomination, uh, gets elected president. Does he say, why don't you come in the government with me? What did you say? We had a conversation about that. At the end of the day, I thought it would be awkward to be best friends and a colleague with people you know, in the administration. So as I was driving here today from the south side of Chicago, I saw some big construction underway in the south side of Chicago near the University of Chicago campus. Uh, that is where the Obama Foundation that you're the chair of, is that right? Right. right. Is building a, is it, you call it a center? Presidential or a, center. Okay. So what is it going to be, what's going to be done there? We're trying to build a place that creates an environment, a network, the center of the universe for change. And can we create a place that accelerates the way the world, the pace at which the world becomes a better place? And so bring leaders, connect them, teach them the ways to navigate um, their worlds to make their ideas and programs more successful more quickly. So did you find it harder to ask for money for Vistria or harder to ask for money for the Obama Center? Uh, look. I don't find either of them very hard because I think there's a payoff for people who choose to invest in either. Only do business with people you like. And uh, there have been one or two times that I didn't follow that advice. Every time uh, it ends up being a mistake. Now that you've built this very successful firm, what does your mother tell you about the decision to leave General Motors? <laughs> Wasn't a bad idea after all. Now, there are relatively few private equity firms that have been founded or co-founded by African Americans. Why do you think that is, and was that make it harder for you to get this off the ground or make it somewhat easier because people were trying to help you a little bit more? Well, I think uh, one of the reasons is just exposure. You know, I had no idea in high school or in college, and even in business school, uh, for that matter, what private equity was and how it worked and how you got into it and what the right career paths to get there were. So I think that's one of the reasons uh, why you don't see more African Americans in the business. Um, I do think there is a focus on give, providing opportunity for people of color to enter this industry, but that opportunity sometimes is constrained, right? They, they let you in through emerging manager programs, but when you get a certain size, you're no longer eligible and you hit a ceiling. 
And so I think it's a real challenge in that regard, but but changing and I think getting better. Many people probably come to you for investment advice. If you go to a cocktail party, people say, what should I do with my money? What would you tell a person to do with $100,000 today? Well, look, I mean, it just kind of broad general advice is I, I think you can look at the history of the U.S. stock market and you know you're going to get a predictable uh, positive outcome over the long term. And so if I think if people have a long horizon in life that there's no better place to put your money than in debt and equities and public markets in, in the U.S. And so I, I kind of refrain from telling people to take okay. these um, outside, you know, uh, what, is, what is the risk. best investment advice you've ever received? Well, look, I learned a lot from the Pritzker family. Uh, you remember Jay Pritzker was the patriarch of the family when I uh, went into business with, with Penny. Uh, and they had a number of things that, uh, that, that still resonate with me uh, in business. One, uh, only do business with people you like. And uh, there have been one or two times that I didn't follow that advice. And every time, uh, it ends up being a mistake. Uh, two is, you know, anytime you're in a business and you are trying to create value, uh, they used to have a, 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 a little saying in their family that, like, running a business is like being locked in a room with no doors and no windows. And you, as an entrepreneur or operator, have to find the hidden door. You have to find the hidden window that's going to create, open up access to, to value. So just a number of things from the family and their ex ex ethic and philosophy around investing that, that resonates with me and I carry all the time. And what do you think is the uh, most common mistake that investors generally make? Well, I, I think people think b just because you pay a low price, uh, just because you pay a low price doesn't mean you didn't overpay. And just because you pay a high multiple doesn't mean that you overpaid, right? So, so I think people make a mistake of thinking that value is just the the price, but there there are a lot of subtleties to to, to creating value in, in this business that you have to be uh, acutely aware of and, and engaged in. So, when you're not running your firm and you're not being the father to five children and you're not helping with the Obama Center, what do you do on the outside for the one or two minutes a week you might have <laughs> available? Are you uh, still uh, uh, not playing basketball anymore. Not playing basketball Are you a anymore. Golfer? Too old. I, I like to golf. Uh, I like to spend time with my friends and, and family. And can you beat Barack Obama in golf? You know he's gotten pretty good. He's gotten pretty good. He's a single digit oh. uh, handicap, and uh, so anybody who goes out and plays with him, uh, giving you advance notice. He's, well, he's, there's some people in private equity who might say that the, there's an inverse relationship between your handicap and your rate of return. So you don't want to have too low a <laughs> handicap because your rate of return might go the wrong way. I'm terrible. Okay. I'm a terrible right, golfer. Okay, I enjoy it, but I'm not very good. Suppose somebody came to you and said, um, you've done very well in business. Uh, you're very personable. You know Barack Obama. Uh, why don't you run for office? <laughs> what would you say? Uh, no way. I mean, I, I don't think I have the personal attributes to be good at politics. Uh, I thrive in an environment where 100% of the people are on the same page and are pursuing the same objective and have agreed to a, a path forward. That's really hard to do in, in politics. Uh, it takes a different constitution to reconcile the fact that half the people disagree with you. Or if they don't, they want to figure out a reason to disagree with you. I, I don't have a profile. Forget to, politics. To Suppose the President of the United States, uh, President Biden, said, you know, I got to know you uh, when Barack Obama was president. Um, you should come in and be a cabinet officer or something. You would say? That's tough. I feel I can make a better impact uh, doing what I'm doing. We really think we figured out how to leverage the private capital to make a real difference in the world and at the same time generate a really good return.